Hi, today I'm talking about viruses, and this is one of several videos that you will have links to about viruses. This is just some really general information. I'm going to start with a reminder from the very beginning of the semester that viruses are considered non-living. And the reason they're considered non-living is they basically don't meet all those definitions of life that we established at the beginning of the semester, but they do have some. They do have a genome, but it's not always DNA. Sometimes it's a DNA genome and sometimes it's an RNA genome. Living organisms never have RNA as their genome. Okay, but that's not the reason why they're considered non-living. They're considered non-living because they cannot reproduce without a host cell. They are missing a lot of the necessary things to reproduce. And we're going to talk about what those things are today. They also just can't carry out basic metabolism, including the fact that they can't make their own energy. But one characteristic that they do have that they share with living organisms is they can evolve slash adapt. And we see that as a major problem for us as viruses have evolved and adapted to be able to infect the cells of every living organism, every type of living organism. So bacteria, archaea, plants, animals, fungi, all can be infected with viruses. How do viruses infect living cells and reproduce in those cells? We're going to talk about that. And we're also going to, in that discussion, talk about what viruses don't have that they require from those living cells. So we're going to talk about the viral reproductive cycle. Before that though, I just wanna draw a basic viral structure on the board. So viruses are very, very simple in structure. They have on the outside some type of protein coat called a capsid. And inside that capsid is the viral genome. When we say viral genome, there are some crazy things that can happen with the viral genome. The viral genome can be double-stranded DNA, which obviously is what all living organisms have as their genome. But it can also be single-stranded DNA. That does not exist in any living organism. It can be double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA does not exist in any living organism. Plus living organisms don't have RNA as their genome. Sorry about the glare on the board right now. They can also have single-stranded RNA. Okay, single-stranded RNA is the normal form of RNA, but no living organism has RNA as a genome. So viruses have some pretty crazy genomes. They can also have circular genome, similar to what bacteria have. They can have a linear genome. There are some crazy possibilities there. And then some viruses on the outside of this capsid have a viral envelope. And that viral en envelope is going to have some proteins associated with it. And oftentimes that viral envelope is actually made from host cell membrane. So in green, we have the viral envelope and some important proteins associated with that envelope. Also on the inside of the virus, there are some key enzymes, three in particular that you're going to learn about today. So I'm going to draw just some proteins here. This is pretend protein shape. These are the viral enzymes. And I'll talk about what those viral enzymes are 
as we go through the viral reproduction cycle. Again, I apologize. This is double stranded RNA and single stranded RNA. I don't know how to get light on the board and not have a reflection on the board. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so that's just a basic viral structure. Viruses do differ slightly in structure. The capsid can have all different kinds of shapes. And um, the phages that infect bacterial cells have really crazy shapes. And I'll show you those in another video. Okay, let's talk about the basic reproduction of viruses. So this is going to be viral reproduction. Viruses have co-evolved with their host cells and have adapted to be able to trick the host cell into letting it in. And they do that by first attaching to the host cell. And they do that using those proteins that are on the surface. So they can use capsid proteins, if it is what we call a naked virus that doesn't have an envelope. Okay, or glycoproteins on the viral envelope. And just by bad luck for the host cell and good luck for the virus, those proteins can perfectly fit into receptors on the host cell surface. So the glycoproteins or the proteins on the capsid fit into host cell receptors. Those host cell receptors are there for that host cell to do its cell job. It's kind of like having someone come up to your house and they just randomly have a key on their keychain that fits the lock on your door and now they can get in. Okay, even though they don't live in your house and you've never given them a copy of that key. That's what happens with these viruses. This is why viruses are very host specific and cell type specific. Because the lock is a little bit different on everyone's cells. So host specific, you can't get your dog sick, your dog can't get you sick without some type of mutation happening to that virus to allow it to now infect a different species of organism. And that's because the receptors on the cell surface are shaped a little differently in every species of organism, unless they're very, very closely related in some cases. Okay, and they're also very cell type specific. Different cell types have different types of receptors so they can do their cell job. So the cells of your intestine have different receptors than cells in your lungs, for example. So this is why viruses are host specific and cell type specific. If they're allowed to attach, sometimes another step occurs called fusion in which the viral envelope actually kind of zips together or fuses with the host cell membrane. And then for sure that virus is getting into the host cell. Okay, HIV is an example of a virus in which the viral envelope fuses with the host cell membrane. Now that virus is going to gain entry into the cell. It can gain entry in a number of ways. It can get entry through endocytosis or just based on the fact that it has connected to the receptor, it is allowed entry. It can inject just its genome and its enzymes, but either way, we have step two, which is viral entry. And sometimes uncoding is necessary if the entire virus entered. And that means removing that capsid on the outside of the virus. And now the viral enzymes and the viral genome are in the host cell and it's ready to start doing its thing. If it's an RNA virus, there's going to be another step necessary before it can start replicating. 
remember, just as a little side story here, that DNA becoming RNA is called transcription. To go the other direction for RNA to become DNA is called reverse transcription. This does not happen in living organisms and therefore living organisms don't have the enzyme to do this. This is one of the enzymes that the virus brings with it. It's an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Remember that most enzymes end in ASE and they tell you what they do. So if it's an RNA virus, reverse transcriptase enzyme is going to carry out reverse transcription. It's going to convert viral RNA to viral DNA. And now viral DNA is in the cell and now it can start using the host cell as a reproductive factory. The next step is the virus needs to get its DNA into the host cell DNA to start using it as a reproductive factory. So step five here, if it's a DNA virus, it will go directly to this step. Okay, so this step four is only if it's an RNA virus. Otherwise, it'll go directly to step five. By the way, the way I'm numbering these steps is just to help us keep track of it, okay? If you look at a textbook, it might not necessarily be numbered this way. It's just how I'm doing it today on the board. Okay, the next step is the virus needs to integrate its DNA into the host cell DNA. I think I'm on number five, sorry if I'm not, but it's viral DNA integration. And that is using another enzyme that the virus brought with it called integrase. So now that viral DNA is in the host cell DNA. And when the host cell replicates its DNA, it's going to replicate the, vi the viral DNA. Why does the virus need to do this? It's because viruses do not have DNA polymerase. They need host cell DNA polymerase in order to copy their DNA, along with all of the other machinery that's used to replicate DNA. The virus is going to use the host cell machinery to do that. It's also going to use host cell RNA polymerase to make viral mRNA. And it's actually going to make one long piece of viral mRNA that represents all the viral genes because the goal of this virus is to reproduce as quickly as possible. It's not trying to just make one protein at a time, it's trying to make all of the viral proteins at the same time. So it's going to make one long piece of viral messenger RNA that's going to leave the nucleus, it's going to go out to a host cell ribosome, it's going to use host cell machinery to start assembling viral proteins. So viral protein translation is going to be step seven. So it's going to use everything the host cell has for making proteins. It's going to use host cell ribosomes, which includes the host cell ribosomal RNA um, host cell tRNA, host cell amino acids to make its proteins. And it's going to make one long polypeptide chain. Again, it's not trying to just make one protein. It's going to make one polypeptide that represents all of its proteins. That is going to have to get cut into functional units at some point. 
Now the virus can start assembling new virions. Virion is the term we use for viral particles. So number eight is going to be viral assembly. It's then going to leave the host cell wrapped in host cell membrane, and that's often called budding. So virions leave the host cell wrapped in membrane. And now it has all of the cell surface markers, and now it's going to really readily infect other host cells because it's going to be recognized almost as self by those host cells. There's a, an important maturation stage that's involved, but also, you know, after budding and sometimes concurrent with budding, those proteins now get cleaved into functional units. They're going to have to get cut into the separate proteins and then they'll start to fold into their final configuration. And that's a step called protein cleavage. I'm just going to leave that polypeptide up there again for a minute. Okay, so I'm going to call this step 10. Protein cleavage. Inside that new virion, one last viral enzyme is going to be involved, and it's called protease. Protease cuts the polypeptide into functional units, functional proteins, and they'll fold into the final configuration. So that's how a virus infects host cells. The next video will go into more detail about specific viruses.